Hey everybody, it's Eric with Barrel and Hatchet, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Hatchet Cast. Um, I have a special guest with me today, Yana, and today we're actually going to be talking about CBRN, which is Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear Threats and Contingency Planning. Um, we're also going to talk about preparedness, but in the CBRN world, and so we brought on Yana to kind of talk us through that, educate us, and maybe get rid of some misconceptions about gear or equipment or the threats of things and, and, and things of that nature. So, Yana, thank you for coming on today, and uh, yeah, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, Eric. Thank you for having me, and I would love to. So, I am actually a 74 Delta in the Army, which is a Seaburn Specialist. And so, yeah, I'm an expert in the field and hope you can answer some of your questions. And also, I'm a National Guard. So while I'm not dealing with seaborne threats in the guards, um, I'm doing my PhD in microbiology. So maybe we can talk about, you know, some pathogens and stuff like this as well. Cool. I, I actually, so um, one of the things I saw off your social media is you are actually a skydiving enthusiast as well. Yes, that is true. I think like I'm chasing the one percent, you know, wherever I can because skydiving has very few women in the sport. We like less than thirteen percent, you know, one percent being in the army and a woman in the army and on top of just doing my PhD in STEM. So yes. <laughs> So you're living a super on the edge life, nothing like sea burn and skydiving mixed together. Yeah, I couldn't get any better. I love adrenaline and good challenges. So wherever I can, you know, if you have a good challenge, sign me up for it. <laughs> Absolutely. So actually, so from your accent, are you from Germany, I'm assuming, originally? or? Yeah, you, um, you're right on. I um, grew up in Germany. I've been born and raised close to Frankfurt in Germany. They're kind of more on the countryside, but usually people know Frankfurt because, you know, we have the very big airport there and our very big bank of Europe that is printing all the euros. And I got very lucky that I was able to join the army because I was a green card holder and they gave me citizenship about like half a year ago. So now I'm American all the way. Congratulations. That's awesome. How, how exciting was that to be able to get that? It was pretty exciting. Like I love the US. I actually was a high school exchange student in 2011 and 12. And I always knew kind of that one way or that another way I will be back here. And then when I started to pursue my PhD and I started to live in Florida, I really decided to make this a permanent home. And yes, looked into ways on how to get citizenship and how to make a little bit money on the side. You know, as a grad student, money is really tight. And somebody told me from my friends who was in the army, yes, you should like sit down, you know, talk to a recruiter and there's ways for you that they can get you citizenship and some money on the side. And I was like never the sportiest person, but even I had a lot of fun and um, basic and it came like really easy to me and I'm loving it. So now I'm going for officer, I'm doing ROTC and hopefully going to go active duty in the medical field later on as a microbiologist. That would be great, yeah. Wow, that's awesome. That's definitely a heck of a plan that you have ready to go. And uh, definitely, I think you'll be perfectly fine making it through that program. Um, now, one of the things that you said, you said you lived in Frankfurt. Um, obviously, there's a lot of stuff going on in Europe right now. Um, I wonder, do you, from your perspective, based off of things that you're seeing um, with the Russia-Ukraine conflict, is there... A poss always a possibility of a CBRN type threat, specifically like nuclear or chemical? I think this is always a possibility. And, you know, with Putin acting kind of crazy, supposedly even have like threaded to start um, nuking out places, it's very scary. And my family, they're all still in Germany. You know, the Ukrainian border is less than like 1,000 miles away so it's very scary and I was very concerned and when the war first broke out I was in basic training and my drill sergeant took me aside and said like yes give me you know phone numbers addresses anything on your parents and like direct family so we can fly them out if shit hits the fan and so it's it's scary yeah absolutely I have uh, uh most of my family I have family in Korea so anytime the North decides to do something spicy or there's any, you know, with the growing Chinese threat, um, that's, that's always a concern. But I think the, uh, so I, 
just out of curiosity, do you think that uh, China also, I know that's a threat that we no, nobody really talks about anymore, is more apt or has the capabilities to mostly more use like a chemical type threat? Or um, what are some countries that you know of or think of that possibly would be more apt to use that type of that type of uh, attack? Well, I hope like nobody would use it because like to my knowledge, it's like war crimes, you know, but I mean, we um, saw it in like Syria where the president used seven on his own people and guests like, you know, women and children and anybody in their sleep. And um, the seven use, you cannot even smell it, you know, it sinks into the basements where like people were sleeping to hope, like hoping to protect themselves from rocket attacks. And so they're basically suffocated in their sleep. So it's scary. I think like any country really would be capable of. China has like most people in the world, you know. So with that comes also a lot of brain power. So I think they have a really good chemist, like in the research world, like besides from, you know, threats, great research com comes out of China. So... I think they have the capabilities, just like anybody, any country would have the capability. Yeah, wow. Uh, so you, you kind of mentioned like sarin gas. What are some of the different chemical agents that can be delivered, like their characteristics versus like an airborne that you can breathe in versus like you said, a, more of a, it, it kind of settles down. Like do you, what are some of the different types of chemical agents in their delivery and some of the characteristics that could be expected historically? So gas historically has been one of the most used um, chemical warfare agents. When we think of like the uh, trench wars, you know, in like World War One, that's kind of where like our gas masks came from to protect us from this, where people threw like mustard gas among like others, just like gassing the soldiers out and getting them out of the trenches. Um, there is just like different types of gases. Some you can like smell, some you can see, others are odorless and colorless. And for most of them, you can like suffocate pretty much because they affect the lung. Obviously, we breathe it in, so that makes sense. But there are also, we call them blister agents, who kind of like more interact with the skin. And this can be either sticky substances or gas as well. They kind of are like highly irritating on the eyes, on um, anything that is muscus covered. So like the nose, um, the lung as well, the tongue. Yes, and they typically like burn really badly, kind of, you know, when you um, pour hot water on yourself. That's why they're called blister agents. They make you blister. Now, as far as the, let's just say, for example, in, you know, we happen to have where there is an attack on the U.S. This is, you know, all theoretical. But if someone came across an area that had some of these blister agents, let's say the blister agents for for now, and then we'll kind of go into the other ones as well, the other categories. Um, if I walk into an area, what are some immediate signs that I'm, I should know something's wrong, specifically for like the blister agents? So a lot of the blister agents are like kind of slimy substances on the surface, so you can see them somewhat. They are often like darker in color, you know, kind of oily looking. So you can keep an eye out for this. Also, obviously, if you walk, happen to like walk into the area that got affected, there must be like other animals or people affected. So if there's like dead animals and a ridiculous amount or like just like people being affected, that's a good um, sign. Or if you touch something and, you know, you get a blister with a blister agent, that should be your first sign. <laughs> so, yeah, try to rinse it off or like try not to touch anything as good as you can or turn around. Is there, what do I use to, what, is there like a spe special paper or lotion or something to rinse this off? Can I use just regular water? Yeah, so water and soap in the sebum world is your most efficient friend because if you can like rinse it off, obviously you get that chemical away, right? And you dilute it so it's not as potent on it. So that's how um, pretty much we decom people too. And like, you know, if something hits, then the first thing that we do is undress the people and like rinse all of these chemicals away as good as we can to get these chemicals away from the people's um, skin and like to try to uh, 
to dim in the spread of it, right? Because if you're in a contaminated area and you wander around, it's on your shoes, it's on your clothes, you spread this in like areas even that were not contaminated in the first place. So we try to decon people with plenty of water and soap. There's also papers that you can kind of test if something is in the area and you can kind of dip it. And this paper is kind of a color indication. So if it changes the color, it gives you a clue what agent you're dealing with. That's usually included in like Seaborn kits that we have in the army for Seaborn specialists. Wow. So so actually, uh, I'm actually looking at Mira Safety's website because we talked about, you talked about the papers. And what's interesting is you can actually, they have... Um, these papers, they have one, it's a uh, Seaburn detection paper, um, detects G agents, sarin, soman, tubin, V agents, VX gas, blister agents, um, adhesive. So you can stick it on the outside of your vehicle. So it, uh, what do these detection papers do? I know it says it detects it, but how does it traditionally detect that stuff um, normally? I mean, obviously, you can like imagine it's kind of a fil filter paper, kind of when you touch it, it almost feels like a coffee um, filter for most of the time. And so it needs to come in contact with the agent because how it detects it is per color change. So that's how you can distinguish what you're having because um, one agent is like going to be turning the paper red, you know, another one green, and then you have um, your key with it so you can compare the green color to the key and see like oh this is like a blister agent or like oh this is a nerve agent oh, okay so it'll actually change color and things of that nature so you could visually inspect the paper to see if it's contaminated yes or not. that's correct like you don't need any additional equipment to basically read it out it's detection within milliseconds right on the spot and this paper is like super sensitive so the tiniest droplet of it turns the paper in the color like there's not really a threshold that you need to like saturate it or whatever the tiniest droplet you can see it how it changes it what if i'm um what if i have let's say for example i, I have a pack of it with me is there something else that could give it a false reading or contaminate like if it was exposed to sunlight for too long or or is it pretty like you can just have it around and not have it covered like so for example what i want to put it into a ziploc bag to keep it sealed um so it's not open to the environment until it's ready to be used yeah i mean i think like soaking it in water is like not helpful because it it imagine it like a coffee filter right if your coffee filter is saturated with water it's not going to you're not able to like put any more water or like liquids on it because it's already soaked so water is an enemy but yeah other than this um it can give false reading like in seaborn school just to see how the color change works without, you know, being exposed to nerve agents. We use like mosquito spray to spray it on it. And like this um, led to a reading because like some of the ingredients in mosquito sprays. So you're saying that mosquito spray has chemicals that are not probably good for my Yeah, skin. like definitely not health beneficial, but I mean, it is like target for insects. So yeah, fine, you know, and I think like, don't. <laughs> drink the whole bottle of mosquito spray but how it must be yeah, absolutely fine oh boy so yeah that's that's no that's really good so you say if if you go into a contaminated area a lot of people that buy their own equipment it's very expensive right so if i buy body armor or if i buy uh vests or my own helmet and stuff my own uniform sometimes that or camouflage pattern clothing that can be, or even a rifle, you know, like that can get, if that gets stuff on it, is there a way to clean that? Or is that pretty much like if it's contaminated, you probably don't want to touch it at all? No, there is like ways to decon it. Again, you can like, whatever you can rinse down, you know, for example, gas, gas masks, you know, you can clean them like anything, but like the filters are usally reusable. So we, how we clean our masks is like take them apart and again, water and soap your best friend and some with water and soap make sure it's like really really dry before we assemble it and then like store it away also i think there's a like kind of like decon lotions and um powder for equipment that you can use so you can like dab it down and decon it this way so that that's actually yeah so i mean i guess it would be technically at your own risk you know like how well is it deconned and are you really wanting like if i had stuff on my body armor i'd probably be like i'll just find another one you know um but that's that's kind of risky you put it on you miss the spot and all of a sudden you got burns on your neck yeah again. so 
could definitely um, you remember the paper that we talked about like do a swipe test on your equipment after you decon it and like just see do i get like the color change on my paper if yes maybe i didn't do like the most you know efficient cleaning job and need to decon it again wow no that makes sense so kind of taking that paper and rubbing it on your gear after it's been decon to see if there's anything left over yes that's correct yeah okay so uh we, talking about the blister agents, what are what are what is V gas or V agents? Are those nerve VX? Um, yes, that's a very good question. So C burn school has been a while, and I kind of been not doing <laughs> actively C burn. No, that's fine. I mean, uh, I think like um, blister agents. So like here it says like I think like mustard gas was a blister agent. Um, but like things like sarin and soman and t t taboon, am I saying that right? Um, those are more, I've heard of like different ones. There's nerve, there's lung, and there's skin contact agents. Um, so, you know, I'm assuming for the, the more, um, the breathable agents, are those the ones that are attacking your lungs and you smell them? Um, or is that uh, a nerve agent that maybe I could smell it? But, you know, what I'm saying it might be too late if I smell it. Like the problem with, you know, chemical warfare is that not necessarily you are able to detect it by like seeing or smelling it. And that's what makes them so dangerous. Like, again, like sarin is odorless, colorless. So you kind of, you know, feel the effect when it's almost too late because like sarin instantly, you know, makes um, you, you can able you are not able to breathe if you breathe in sarin gas. Like it kind of paralyzes your lung and like you cannot breathe. So like people suffocate from sarin. Versus like um, VX is um, a synthetic chemical compound and it is actually a nerve agent. So it affects, I think, the nervous system more. But yeah. Wow. I mean, it's, it is terrifying to think because it's one of those things that's like an invisible killer. Um, you know, in World War One, historically, that was something that just absolutely terrified people. Even, even the uh, the the psychological effects of, you know, whenever I have, whenever you have a gas mask on, it's never a good time. Like it's always, it's like trying to breathe through a sock, you know. So even if I don't have that Seaburn uh, agent being delivered, I still have all that equipment that I'm trying to still be proactive and still conduct activities or defend myself. And now I'm covered with all this extra equipment that's limiting my breathing. Um, it, it just is definitely something that is going to limit you um, in order to, one, yes, save your life, but it will limit your ability. Yeah, and you have to think, you know, just because you have C-burn system, you're not supposed to live in it. It's like more made for short-term use. I think like up between like 24 and 48 hours. And um, when we go into the field, you know, in the seabam world and like full mob gear, we make sure to change out after so and so many hours because yes, like it has a shelf life, but when you actually wear it and use it in a chemical environment, um, the time is limited that you can spend in it before you need to change out. Yeah, I mean, assuming also if I don't lose my mind having a gas mask on for hours at a time, I think I would just go nuts. I get claustrophobic. Um, yeah. So definitely try and find your way out of that environment if it's contained. Yeah, as fast as you can, because you have to think, you know, if you wear like a seaburn or hazmat suit or mop gear, it's hot. You um, are in your own sweat for the longest time. You cannot go pee pee and poo poo easily, you know. So yeah, <laughs> yeah you got to find, you know, a way like either hold it or yeah, the alternative, you know. Oh, Lord have mercy. Yeah, that that's no, but those are things that folks don't really think about. Like, oh, not how am I going to eat? Like I can drink, but how am I going to eat? How am I going to use the bathroom? You know, and those are real things that you have to try and really think about uh, those hard questions. Um, so you, you talked about uh, a little bit about how um, you go into an area and if it's contaminated, then you need to, before you come back, to base or come back to wherever you're staying, you need to have decon or decontamination. What what does that decon unit look like if you were to set one up in the field to be able to clean off and decontaminate people who are coming back to their base or home? So yes, let's say in let's for example, we're going to use a nuclear strike, right? And we're going to have some wind. So it would be good if 
you are listening and you don't know how to read the wind to get like an idea how to read the wind you know look at the surrounding flags americans love their us and a flag in what directions is it uh, flowing you know in what directions do the branches of a tree move and like always move upwards from the wind because this is where the decon stations are going to be set up or well, if the wind shifts the decon st station kind of shifts with it to be upwind and so then when you come to it we kind of have like the hot zone the warm zone and the cold zone so the hot zone is all of this contaminated area right in the middle we kind of can imagine those zones kind of like a dartboard with three circles right like the inner circle being hot hot in color as hot zone then we have like a warm zone around it this is where your decon station is going to be and um if like something hits we going to as even soldiers going to strip you naked because we don't want like anything to come out from this hot zone right into the cold zone where it's like nice and clean so people will be asked to undress those who can like undress themselves you know and walk through the shower themselves are going to do so those who are maybe injured and need to be carried will be undressed by seaburn uh, soldiers and then they will be just like sprayed off with plenty of water and um, leave anything behind after the, they're out of the shower we're going to give them towels blankets new clothes you know so they don't need to run like around any more naked and to keep them warm and yes then there there's usually a medical tent attached after this in the cold zone where we're going to monitor the people and see it that they're good before they're released wow okay so so um you you big thing is you said that that decon site needs to also be mobile right and it needs to be very quickly moved if you need to have it moved or do you guys have like a tent that you like is it like good to set up like a uh, almost like a tent you walk in one side or a couple tents and you have it sealed with plastic or what would be the best way to uh, tackle that? Yes, you got this 100% right. Like usually um, a very simplified decon station contains kind of, you know, um, of a station where you first take off your shoes and kind of wash your feet, then like undress and step into a mobile shower that is kind of in a pop-up tent, more or less covered with tabs or like some sort to control the rinse off, right? Because in the rinse off, that carries all of the chemicals that we're trying to get rid of in a decon station. So um, a rinse off control needs to be established at, as well of some sort. And then usually there's like one tent afterwards for like people to dry off, to get like dressed, you know. And yes, after this, it's pretty much like pop-up tents with like big fans that blow them up. So it's like easy transportable, easy to move around and easy to set up. Is is the, if, if say for example, I just got deconned off. Um, m most of the time, do you have individuals who've been, who have been decontaminated to go immediately to a enclosed area so that way if the wind does change they don't get recontaminated everybody's inside of a tent um it depends like you know sometimes you can set up let's say it's like freezing cold in the winter right you don't want to set up a decon station outside because 99.9% .9 of the time you won't even have like um, warm water to like rinse the people off. So then kind of like decon stations can be established in buildings such as like um, school buildings that have like public showers available to keep the people warm and like not from freezing and then they would be inside. But also anything that is like around at this point that is not in a hot or warm zone anymore is the cold zone. So it should be clean. So they can like not decontaminate themselves again and also you know like the boundaries of the red zone there's going to be like military or first responders there who are going to um, have that taped off to avoid like people from re-entering the hot zone wow that's that's huh, something to think about for real especially not just an individual level of preparedness but also having a community maybe decontamination unit or working with like local law enforcement or first responders do are there cbrn units in within the first like public safety 
I think um, they are trained on like hazmat for sure. I know like firefighters are trained on like hazmat situations and like a contamination, um, like this, a big decontamination event like this is a mass effort. So I know the military then tries to work closely together with the local agencies and gets and puts like their help wherever they can, you know. So like it might be doctors monitoring the patients or like police. Um, making sure that nobody re-enters the red zone. Wow. Yeah. So what are, what are some, do you know of any historic, maybe from like your Seaburn MOS school, um, of any historic events where in, in the, you know, recent times within the past 30 years that stood out to you that were like, wow, that was a pretty devastating attack. I mean, like I can only those pictures from the Syrian attack, you know, um, those burned really images into my brain because especially children are very, very um, prone to die from sarin because their bodies can like simply not handle it. So, so many children died horribly and like basically suffocated. So that's horrible. And I think it's most of the most recent attacks as well. Yeah, in Syria, uh, in the Middle East. I know there was also one in, in Tokyo. There was actually a terrorist attack on that. I think it was in Tokyo. Do you remember this? Yeah, you're that? right. There was like a subway attack in Tokyo, but it was like a while back. It wasn't pretty recent. I want to say it was like in the 70s or 80s. And they used um, chemical warfare as well. But it was like a terroristic group within like Tokyo. So like, again, their own people on their own people. It was like no outsiders. Now, some of the delivery systems, is that usually like outside of like a terrorist attack? Is it usually like missiles or artillery? Like how is this, how is these, these chemical attacks usually delivered? I know in World War One they used to like just have big tanks and just blow it, you know, like. I know like um, in Syria, they did use missiles and like, you know, NATO inquired and all of this and were able to um, con like find some of the missile bodies so they like knew it was missiles there but i mean um the other ones there's like gas grenades you know where you can like throw the gas so that is yeah i don't know for like chemical warfare but i know for sure like you know um like a riot grenade almost yeah like you you can throw it pretty much and then i oh. think you know um Bio agents, they're like slightly different. They like usually use like smaller um, bomblets to dis, um, distribute bio agents because of course when it explodes and you have something alive in there, you know, you kill it. That's like how we, you know, sterilize equipment. And what, that was like so what is, what, what ex, oh, sorry. Oh, no, <laughs> uh, what, what is the difference between chemical and biological? I feel like that kind of just gets blended together. And people like, you know, I, I for myself am not as educated about the real difference between the two. Okay, it's quite easy, you know, bio, like biology, the study of life, correct? So it is either a living organism or like something made by a living organism versus chemicals. They're usually made in a lab somewhere and are not, um, you know, they're like synthesized. So no organism necessarily made it. And so also kind of like the effects are going to um, vary a lot. Like usually with like most biological agents or like, you know, um, that delivery system is going to act over weeks and like people are going to fall sick and sick and sick. Kind of how we saw it with COVID. Not saying at all that like, you know, COVID was a biotech of any sort. But it is designed, most of them, where you have kind of waves and people falling sick after they got affected, right? And so they're going to walk away and after a week they fall sick versus a chemical agent most of the time acts immediately and you're like, no, something is up. So bio attacks are usually harder to detect because we don't know it, that it happened, right? Till people fall sick and till animals die and all of this stuff and so it's a lot harder to contain for sure if you had a bio attack and you're like oh what's this maybe it was just a bad round or a bad missile and before you know it it's like okay you're we're all getting sick at the same time and now who did who spread that and who else has it and trying to contain that 
um, to, to decon, I'm sure must be a nightmare. Yes, that's like the biggest risk with um, biological attacks, right? Just like the spread. And now in our modern world, you know, um, we have so much contact, right? Like p people taking public transportations in the big city alone, you know, usually um, bio, or like bacteria or viruses of any sort are distributed by stuff that we touch from somebody else or um, kind of gets aerolized, so like people sneezing and coughing and putting like tiny droplets in the air, right? And then you breathe it in and now you have that stuff in your lung, which guess what? It's like uh, very well, you have like a lot of blood in your lung, so it goes like right into your bloodstream and yeah, can happily amplify in your body. If I am in doing my planning, let's say I, I wanna be prepared and I just wanna make sure my family's safe, my children are safe in the event that the far possibility that there is an attack. Um, is it best sometimes to just kind of stay in place versus venturing out? Um, or would you always have a mask with you just in case you came across an area that's contaminated? Walking around outside and there's a chemical attack happening, of course, you know, you want to leave that area that is contaminated, kind of like the same when you're outside and like a nuclear strike hits the more distance you can get between and, you know, ground zero the higher are your chances going to be of survival in the end. So with like a bio attack, since it's like so hard to detect, I think they're going to like try to contain it, you know, and if you have it, you will be like hospitalized or kind of stuck at home, kind of, you know, when we caught like COVID or really bad flu. So you're not going to spread that any further. Wow. Is, so kind of talking about the nuclear portion, um, I, I wanted to kind of break down the different types of uh, nuclear attacks. There are, I'm assuming, different types of delivery of attack or different styles. Um, what what type of, do you know the type of attacks that are in the nuclear category? Yeah, you're right on point. So usually there's like different strikes, right, that you can have. You can have like a ground burst or an air burst. And so with an air burst, basically what the difference is... Um, it's that an airburst is not creating kind of this mushroom shaped dark cloud that all of us like associate with a nuclear burst. And so, with like an airstrike, it explodes in the air, it's like a smaller fireball, you know, some bright light, maybe some winds, but that's about it. Versus, like, if an atomic bomb goes off on the ground, we're going to get this mushroom shaped cloud with this like really dark stem and all of this basically dark brown stuff is soil that gets sucked up and like catapulted up into the air by the explosion and this is actually really problematic because this is going to create a radiological fallout right that can be really fine can be transported by wind over miles and miles and then it's going to rain dirt basically from the sky contaminating the the area wherever like the cloud comes down in its entirety and like covers it so wow that's terrifying um as far as the uh <laughs> a, a, a ground or air burst is the air burst mostly to spread out that nuclear material that radiological material further out is that the purpose most of the time um I think if you want to spread it out, you, you would use the ground burst, you know, because you have like this material sucked up in the cloud. And this basically, you have to think it goes like thousands and thousands of feet high, this, this cloud, you know, that's going to hang. And so if you have wind, you can spread this way farther than an um, air burst. Is, is there a way to detect any of this radiological stuff? Is there equipment that I could possibly buy? Um, what are those things where it detects the radio? I can't remember the name of it, but. Yes, exactly. Yeah, kind of. Um, so in my lab, we work with um, radio, basically radio labeling carbon, so like C13. And we kind of use, it almost looks like a really old-fashioned telephone, you know, where it had like the dials, like um, the telephone itself. And you can kind of go over the surfaces that came in touch with and then you get like a sound response if, if it detects um, 
you know, like any radiological material. So those adapters are like the most common ones where you kind of either get like a light or a sound response or like both. And you can simply, you know, kind of walk your line if you like, if that makes sense. So, you know, yes, this is like contaminated or not by like a sound needle or like light response. Okay. Yeah, and I actually was seeing on Mira Safety's website, they actually have, it's called a Geiger dosimeter or a Geiger counter. So a portable Geiger counter it uses the same SBM 20-1 Geiger molar tube as the military, um, EDC friendly, and it reads radiation level in 20 seconds, which is uh, terrifying. So I'm assuming that this is reading, is, is the radiation, is that almost like a dust? Is that the type of thing that it is or... How does how does that settle? No, like radiation, first of all, like it's a very broad term. If you think about like X rays, that is radiation. You know, like UV light, that is radiation. So we gotta be like a little bit careful on when we like talk in radiation, you know, in seaburn, it's like um radiation created by unstable atoms that kind of fall apart and like emit, you know, um energy of some sort. So also, you know, there's like alpha, beta, gamma radiation. So like different types of radiation that can be emitted by this fallout. And like not every equipment can necessarily detect all of these different forms of radioactive radiation, right? Created by unstable atoms. And so I think like the most dangerous is gamma or like ionizing radiation. And so you have to look there's like to my knowledge not one that can detect like all of them uh, if so you have basically different adapters that you can like stick to it but then again it gets like pricey you know the radiation that you need to worry about most about is gamma and ionizing radiation because like this is cancer causing in like you know if it's a strong a strong source like highly cancerous right versus alpha and beta they're like easy to Shield. I work with alpha and beta radiation all the time and I shield it by wearing simply, you know, neutral gloves and having a, a biosafety hood in my lab with a plexiglass shield. So I can shield myself from alpha and beta. But like gamma or like ionizing radiation, that's a whole, you know, other um, beast. And this is where like the dosimeter comes in because if you work with this, there's like really, really strict trash lines on how much radiation you can be exposed to and if you're over that you're like done working with this you know for the year or for ho however long wow wow that's that's insane um so I, i'm looking here on mira safety site again they have a thyro safe potassium iodide tablets what is that necessarily used for like the uh, iodine tablets I like um never really heard of this that this is like used, mm -hmm. but I would like think to kind of like catch free radicals so that it helps to like um offset you know if you got exposed to radiation with uh, the um after effects right, so kind of helping with the symptoms to if you have been ex overexposed it says uh to you can give it to children one pill or adults two pills it's f d a approved um, and it's an iodine supplement to help with your exposure to radiation. Um, so it's very interesting. I've actually heard of this in the past. And actually, the funny story is the more that um, the threat of Ukraine and Russia and China and all this has gone out, I've actually seen that these have been selling out, not just on this website, but across the board. The iodine tablets have been going out of stock because people are just stocking up on them to help with symptoms. What are what are some immediate symptoms that if I am exposed to radiation without a mask, I have no protection, what are some of the immediate symptoms that I can expect to see that I need to get out of that area immediately? Well, it kind of depends, like, you know, again, um, if we talk about radiation, every day, just like by what the sun emits, you are exposed to all of these radiation that I mentioned. But kind of, you know, the doses are so small, so you don't really feel um, effects of it. The problem is, you know, when we are kind of um, get like a dose, a really, really high dose, um, exposed to really high dose. And so that can range, you know, like 
if it's a super super strong uh, source radioactive source then you can actually get burn blisters on your skin yeah it can like burn you or then you have like long-term effects as well kind of like hair loss you know a lot of people lose like teeth have very brittle bones because it affects like bone density or of course most common one you know is like cancer that people develop cancer in the long run some of the some of the symptoms that we saw like after hiroshima and nagasaki was like obviously the blister burns but they also started having like nausea and cancer and also forming tumors um even like irregularity with child with birth uh children were being born with no limbs or having these um handicaps because of the complications with the radiation um immediately yeah, I mean, after the, the big thing with radiation is right that it kind of um it destroys your dna on some level and when you think about your reproductive system basically you know there's like the sperm that carries a little bit of dna and then there's like the dna in the excel and like this merges so of course if both mama and papa got exposed you know and have like damaged dna of course you're going to see that in the baby you know because like limbs are not going to form right issues with inner organs brain development all of this stuff and also you know damages in the dna is what leads to cancer and tumors like it's abnormal growth both of it so something in the dna is broken that makes cell uh, cells amplify like crazy and like growing like crazy and um the body's safety features you know and detection features for this abnormal growth is broken as well and this is when we see like um tumors in cancerous growth wow so if i let's just say for example let's just say uh you know i'm you know i live east of tampa right so it's about a 45 to 50 minute drive away and tampa gets hit by a nuclear missile um as a ground burst what are some immediate actions i live 30 40 miles away what should i be doing and preparing for what would your immediate response be to something of that nature well the good thing is um with a nuclear attack is that the more distance you can get between yourself you know and the source the better off you are in the long run because kind of it the the source are like you know the the exposure what you're exposed to decreases by distance in half so if you live far away you know and you have the chance to hop in your car and drive away do that immediately if you're in the hot zone that's a whole you know different story and like you're really close to the source kind of you should look if you live in the cities for buildings that are made from brick and mortar because they are going to protect you not only from radiation but it's also going to withstand you know strong winds that come with um, a nuclear burst and also going to withstand heat much better you know than like a wooden building that can be blown over easily or catch in flames easily also if you're not necessarily in florida you know and there is like a subway or like underground systems of some sort cellars basements anything of this sort like be aware where those are because that's a good place to shelter and place um as well to you know have like soil or material with you and a radiological source wow that actually is a good source of advice of, of trying to go underground would be kind of your best bet you don't have to have a bunker in the backyard you can actually just find a subway or a, a basement or something of that nature is so kind of going into yeah these are all scary these are all very terrifying things that i hope none of this happens but what are some i'm looking at mirror safety site so they have seaburn masks and uh also what's really cool is they have also um children's gas masks and baby gas mask systems and also hazmat suits um they sent us their cm7m uh, gas mask was one of their most popular ones. It's designed to be used with optics, so for military use, um, and also uses a 40 millimeter NATO gas uh, mask filter, uh, as well as has a bromo butyl rubber, very re resistant to seaburn, similar to the ones that we use in the military. Um, 
Uh, but what are some things that I can do to make sure, because obviously in the military, we have that gas mask fitting, right? We go and we get measured and we get our faces sized for the proper fit gas mask. Um, you know, what can I do to kind of make sure that it just fits or just, I try it on, it doesn't fit and I just return it. So, um, yes, the harness itself should be sizable. So make like sure, you know, and like don't size your mask by yourself. Get like the help of your spouse, of a friend or something like this. When you size to your mask, hold it in place, like snuck to your face and make somebody else adjust your head harness so it sits like snug and tight on um, your face. Once you adjusted this head harness, you're not going to touch it ever again. Only like the chin straps, you can like touch to like loosen it and tighten it. But once you fitted it, that's it. That's like the perfect fit for you. So, you know, don't touch this again. Store it away with these settings. Like don't loosen the straps or anything after you fitted it. And keep it in its um, carrier. Don't put like the head harness over the mask. You know, like some people do this. It's actually really hard on the rubber for like long-term storage and can like make, um, you know, those little rubber pieces that hold the straps in place break off or like crack those. So also you kind of can like test it. You can um, cup your filters with your hands like nice and neatly and like really breathe like in, you know, and if you kind of have like a vacuum pressure feeling almost on your face, then you know your mask is um, sealed. If you can like hear it whistle under your chin or something like this, you know it's leaking. Mm. So uh, one of the things that they sent whenever I, whenever they sent the mask, they sent a canteen for water and also it has a drinking hose so I can actually drink through that canteen, which is a special uh, uh, top on the canteen to be able to allow that hose to fit inside of that so I could drink with the mask on. And they also sent me a filter, uh, the 40 millimeter NATO filter or whatever filter they sent that allows to block from that. Um, obviously, the thicker the filter, the harder it is to breathe through. And I can stick it on either side. So I can put it on the right side or I can screw it off. There's a cap and I can put it on the other side. Um, now, if I was to get another filter, would I want to take that out of the packaging, the vacuum seal packaging, and just put it on the mask and leave my mask there? Or should I have uh, one for training maybe and then keep my other milk? filters seal yeah so you got this right you want to keep it in the package as long as you can because they have kind of like a a lifetime span right when it's um unwrapped and like i don't know how it is with these filters but the filters that we use in the military kind of have a color indicator on the inside of the filter that kind of tells you when they get um bad and this can like come either with like moisture exposure or like just when their time is up so if you can keep them in the package you know um, I would keep it in the package as long as you can. Also, basically, this allows you, if you have a sealed um, filter, for an easier exchange. I think, you know, like, hold your breath, unscrew the filter that you have on it, and, like, reattach the new filter. Then, like, breathe out to blow your mask out, and you should be good. Wow, yeah, that's that's definitely something kind of for the long-term storage or if I'm not immediately using it, keeping it protected as much as I possibly can to preserve that mask because you don't want it to be falling apart when you need it. No, like no exposure to moisture, no exposure to heat, you know, like store it kind of in a dry and dark place. Um, as far as I see on the mirror safety page, like all of them come with carriers or you can like buy a carrier with it. So I would strongly recommend this, you know, recommend that. Um, to buy the carrier with it and also just like if you have the carrier and the mask um, equipment is only as good as its user so like practice donning your mask putting it on within like 30 seconds you know and don't forget to close that mask carrier because if that thing is contaminated from the inside and you put your mask back you know you have like all of the silkiness on it Wow, yeah, you get to have your own personal exposure inside that mask. A very personal experience with the chemicals or radiological issues. Now, some of the, we, we talked about, I want to talk about real quick some of the accessories that they have. They have a speaker that goes onto their mask. Um, is that really necessary? Because usually when I was trying to talk, I was, my voice is so muffled, I couldn't understand, nobody could understand me. So having that speaker, is that a good accessory that you would recommend that would probably be smart to have? 
Yeah, they definitely work. Like we got to play with them um, in Seaburn School, you know, a little bit. But like to my knowledge, the military sadly don't have the money to provide everybody with a speaker because like they're not cheap and they're like pronoun to break easily. So you can talk in your mask. It sounds very, very almost like when you talk having a pillow on your face. That about, like sounds like to me. So kind of um, you have to scream at the person across from you so that they can like understand you in your mask. You know, so if you know like basic hand and arm signal signals, that is going to be helpful. So you don't waste so much energy, you know, like yelling at everybody in your surrounding area. Or if you want to invest the money, um, those speaker system help and you can speak, you know, normally and the other person is able to understand you. I know that as a, so I was a JTAC and, and one of the things is we talk on the radio all the time and you have to have those speakers to be able to talk on the radio, to be able to be able to transmit. So that was something that we had to have those, um, those speaker boxes, but at the same time, it's a speaker. So you speak and everybody can hear you. If you're trying to be tactical, it may not be best to have that where everybody can hear what's going on. Um, now the other thing is we could also wear our headset over top of our mask if we wanted to communicate. Um, but another accessory that I would highly recommend for people and something that, so I, you know, doing a lot of training and shooting and moving and a lot of calisthenics exercises and things of that, rucking and all this, when you exercise or you activate your body and your muscles, you start to breathe heavy. And when you try to breathe heavy with that mask on, it's almost like you hyperventilate. So you're really kind of losing a lot of capability, um, a lot of, you know, a capability of like just being able to breathe something that's so hard to focus on my task because I'm just struggling with the mask. And that's why one of the things that I saw in the military that happened to, but I, it is, it is almost one of those things where it's like, it is an absolute, in my opinion, if you want to operate at full functionality, it is absolutely, uh, vital to have. And that is the papier. Um, so it's a battery pack that forces air through your mask so you don't have to actually suck the air through the filter but this battery pack that goes on your back has a hose that connects to your mask it goes where your filter's at and it actually pushes air into your mask so you don't have to struggle to breathe and suck that through it uses uh, AA batteries 12 hours of runtime, and it's compatible with all their masks um, have you seen these in Seabing School is that something that you saw pretty often or I never saw one in like real life I only saw it on like powerpoints where they said that they're supposedly you know like really common in the medical field I don't know if this is like true or not where like people um wear full full masks with um air that comes from the outside I know like of other systems you know when we like fully encapsulated we have simply like air bottles on our back and like an air hose and air delivery system that comes like pumps like air in the suits. Wow. Yeah, that's something that um I just know from doing all that type of stuff and activities and training, it is just absolutely horrible trying to just breathe in. It's almost like you have to lower your heart rate. So stop, slow down, lower your heart rate and try to breathe normally. But you start to hyperventilate and panic and get claustrophobic with that mask on. Um so yeah, it's definitely one of those things. It it is, in my opinion, for me, and I think for a lot of people, very vital, especially if you have kids. So trying to put a child with a gas mask on, you know how kids get whenever they're trying to breathe or they're ha they're having a struggle, they want to take it off. So having that type of accessory for your child just to breathe normally, um, I think is it's it's a life saving tool that I think is it needs to be paired with the mask. Um, Maybe, you know, people can deal with just having the mask on, but for a child, I think it is absolutely vital. Yeah, I can agree to this. Or, you know, if you have, like, breathing issues in first place, this can, like, definitely help to um, not stress your lung so much. So, like, for the elderly, I think it would be a good idea to have that. And, um, yes, with your children, I can only recommend, you know, if you buy the children's mask for them to also train with them, kind of, because... When you have the mask on, it's like a really weird um, feeling. It's almost like when you have diving goggles on, you know, for like snorkeling and you go like underwater and like dive with them and they like suck to your face. 
this is what it feels like to me because like the mask seals entirely so it's kind of a tight feeling on wherever the rubber like really attaches to your skin to like seal it so like on your chin on your forehead a lot of seabrand soldiers actually like do get headaches from it um, if you make like the mask too tight so again that's like where proper fitting comes in where it seals but like not to the point you know where you have like so much pressure on your head that you can like not stand it to have that on for a long time you know it's funny that you say that that's a good analogy because it's almost like snorkeling have you ever been snorkeling you have that snorkel it's like you're struggling to suck air through that hose that is a, p a perfect analogy of the gas mask but also stick a sock over top of your snorkel <laughs> that's just what it, it is just miserable um and for anybody that's run it uh, i know a couple of buddies that work in law enforcement that have had to go do drug bust because fentanyl is a big problem and they have to go i mean completely covered like sealed from plastic tape around their wrists for their hazmat suits and the mask because they, the fentanyl is so dangerous. Yeah, fentanyl is like milligrams, you know. If you can like imagine a, a gram of salt, you can fit it like on your pinky. Like, you know, use like one corn of salt or like one grain of salt. This is like how freaking deadly um, fentanyl is. So yes, um, I don't know if you like saw the video of like the police officer who accidentally, you know, um, OD'd on fentanyl and luckily her partner was there to save her but yeah it's crazy so i think they should definitely like a mask belongs in any police car when they test for drugs nowadays yeah absolutely so if you're a law enforcement officer or you're a first responder having that mask readily available um, especially if you're going to go into a house or something like that maybe that might be a good idea and also training with that mask on you know doing simple tasks uh, you know, writing on your notebook or, you know, even going to the range and trying to practice with that on is definitely something to consider. And that's a very real world threat um, that could be something you interact with on a daily basis, even for a normal citizen. You know, if you walk in somewhere or you're helping with disaster relief, you know, having that, if you have asbestos or going to, a, I know here in Florida, we got hurricanes and there's a lot of times for people going in the house to help people out, you know, days after, maybe it's a good idea to throw that, that mask on. Why not? And just, you know, one, you get practice on it, but two, it can also protect you from those airborne particles that could be harmful to your health later on in life. Right left. Right left. Last thing I want to talk about was the levels of MOP. Uh, what is, what are the levels of MOP? And, you know, this is understanding, like, if I have my own suit, like, that I bought off Mirror Safety, like the hood, the gloves, the boots... What, what are the different levels of MOP that I can, or readiness that I could go? If there is, I know that there's a, a chemical attack. I've heard about it on the news or it came on the radio. What can I do to be prepared? So kind of there is um, five different MOP levels and like kind of MOP ready. So we have, where you have like everything, you know, readily available for you. And then... The levels are a little bit funky labeled because actually the first mob level is called mob level zero and pretty much nothing is worn but like you have anything on you so that you can put it on as needed right along the way and so then the first real mob level is mob level one where we kind of just wear the suit and like nothing else we carry like our pro mask right and we have like the over boots and the gloves available as comes then in mob level two we wear the suit and the over boots but still no gloves no masks in mob level three we wear the suit boots and our mask and the very last thing that comes on is the gloves because those are kind of like really stiff really thick kitchen rubber gloves so with, when you have like these on it's like super hard to do anything in these gloves and then sometimes you have like you know if you're smart you kind of have under gloves with it because you sweat in these rubber gloves so badly and you kind of your hands swim in their own sweat so if you have like cotton gloves under it on they can like help a little bit to ease that and like suck up the sweat so you have like more mobility or like better grip in these gloves Wow. Yeah, that's definitely, I've also seen people where they tape it and also put the paper or the, the chemical paper on their arm or keep it on their gear. So if they do come in contact with it, they, they know, oh crap, I've got my papers marked. I might have possible contamination. 
Yes, um, that is correct. Like basically you can um, tape kind of your gloves to the suit. But we don't really, I think like do this in mop gear. We, mop, we do this with c burn suits. So with like c burn suits, it's kind of like a plastic, you know, suit that you put on. And if you ever watch like a zombie movie, Usually there were like seaburn suits that are yellow or blue. Those are the most common colors for them with their mask on. And that like, goes over the mask. So like just the eyes and the filters are sticking out of the suit. And with this, you have gloves um, under the suit and you kind of tape any access point that you could possibly have. So like you tape your boots to the suit and you tape um, your arms shut as well as your neckline shut to the mask so you have like no access points and everything is sealed and so then you can tape um, an arm and a leg with the indication paper and it's usually your dominant arm and then the opposite anchor that you tape so you can like see if you rub like off on something and get contaminated so you can get go to decon right out of gate now i saw i saw i remember when we were doing this uh, we were doing decon training. They had this, it was like a glove. It was like a really rough glove that they like pulled out of a package and they would like decon, like they'd like pat you down. Um, and what, what is, is, what is that used for? I've seen it. It is, it's like really weird looking. Yeah. It almost looks like ashes. It's kind of, yeah. Like really when you had like a bonfire for like a long, long time and you have like this white grayish ashes, but like really it's much finer. That's what it looks like. And then the glove almost looks like a really furry, you know, carpet with like, yeah, but it's white. And so when you put the powder on it, you can like tell um, that you have enough powder on it because the white glove turns obviously gray. And so then you kind of like take this and pat as much material as you can. I think it's activated chocolate actually in it, which explains the color. So then you can like pat it, it's like used for equipment. So like on your Humvee, on your rifle, like anything that got like in touch with nerve agents and it's supposed to like neutralize whatever agent it came in touch with. Yeah, I saw here on Mira Safety's website, they have the MDG-1 Personal Seaburn Decontamination Glove. Get instant on-demand decontamination anywhere you go. Maybe that's something that's good to have if it's quite expensive. It's $129, but maybe that would be good something to have at a at a decon site maybe that you establish. Um, that is definitely like not for people. That is for equipment only. So yes, um, you know, if you have... A rifle that went like in with you that would be like something to decon um, usually you know like your overboots and your gloves they can go in soap and water to be rinsed off you don't need the powder on this your mask goes like in soap and water you don't want like really want the stuff on it so if you have like pricey pricey equipment that you um, want to decon you know and like not toss out then this is what this is for but like in Seaburn's we learned like never use this on people. This is solemnly for equipment. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, it probably is. If it's a, if it's a rough cardboard, I don't think it'd be feeling really good on my skin. Uh, Jana, is there any uh, when we're closing this up? Is there any closing statements that you would have for our listeners or viewers about being ready when it comes to Seaburn? Yes, you know, like just do your research, what you think is needed and best for you and your family and loved ones, and then practice with this stuff. If you just have it laying around, you know, in its original seal and you never donned a hazmat suit or you never put on mop gear in your life, you know, then it's not going to be very helpful because what we learn is like 30 seconds to don your mask and like less than seven minutes to put on full mob gear like mob level four you know um so practice be prepared and always inspect your equipment a lot of the stuff has like shelf lives on it where they say they would recommend replacing it after x amount i think it's like five years if i'm not mistaken for like filters and so on and inspect your equipment Every half a year, I would say, for like tears, rips, you know, um, degeneration and the material because it has like rips or, you know, tears, it's not going to protect you. 
Yeah, especially like if it dry rots, if you have it like in the garage and not in an air conditioned environment, that could also be a possibility, especially if it's out of the packaging. Um, wow. Well, Yana, thank you so much for giving us your insights and sharing your expertise with us. Um, I really appreciate that. And um, if you do want to actually um, get some more research material, Yana, where are some good research material? Obviously, the internet. Is there any books that we could buy on Amazon or something of that nature that you would recommend that would be a good resource? You can start simply by, you know, reading Wikipedia entries to understand a little bit more about like how radiation works and to maybe write yourself a little checklist on where you could like shelter in the what if scenario. And then, um, yeah, there is like tons of books, you know, anything from like historical books based on what happened in Hiroshima or kind of like one book that I really love is like called What If? And they kind of ask like what if questions. It's like, I think multiple, um, it's a multiple book series. So you can look into that. Wow, that's awesome. Well, thanks again, Yana. And also for our folks, uh, if you are listening or watching this and you want to see more behind the scenes stuff about Hatchet Cast, go check out our Instagram. Also, uh, check out our Spotify where we interview guests like Yana. And it's only guest episodes, as well as our YouTube. We have our Hatchet Cast channel on YouTube. Once again, thanks again for your support. Also, go out and get training. Remember to invest yourself in yourself. Like Yana was saying, train. Training and being ready and also tr- planning for all those contingencies is a great way to make sure that you're prepared. So if you want to go schedule some training with us, we'd love to train with you. Go check out our website. All the links are below, as well as the gas mask information and the links to Mira Safety are in the description below and will also be in our uh, Spotify descriptions as well. Yana, thanks again so much for coming out and and, uh, sharing all that information with us. And we really appreciate you and would hope to have you again on another episode. Thank you, Eric, for having me. And have a great evening, everybody. All right. Take care.